can get to sleep I think about the implications Of diving in too deep And possibly the complications Especially at night I worry over situations I know we'll be alright Perhaps it's just a yeah, we got a little bit of two songs on uh, that intro. Uh, some Queen and then Colin Hay. Colin Hay used to be the lead singer for a band called Men at, Men at Work, uh, but his solo career has been so much more important than uh, his work with Men at Work. We've been talking about ergonomics, more specifically physical ergonomics, which addresses... Uh, musculoskeletal disorders or work-related musculoskeletal disorders. We've had four videos so far. This will be the last. Now this may be, end up being split into two videos. We'll just see how it goes. Uh, but we want to talk about preventing musculoskeletal disorders. Now we've provided you with a lot of information about musculoskeletal disorders so far, but now we want to talk about prevention measures. Uh, but before we do that, I want to little more Colin Hay there. Before we do that, I want to share with you something that maybe you hadn't thought about. Uh, Overexertion related injuries are some of the most common injuries in the medical industry. Some of you, some of you might end up working as safety professionals for a hospital or other uh, medical organization. Um, and overexertion related injuries, sprain, strains, hernia, spinal column, injury are really common in that industry. Uh, if we were in class, I would ask why and we would talk about it a little bit. But since we're not in class, let me just go ahead and tell you. A lot of it, a lot of it has to do with the patient handling responsibility of workers in the medical industry. Nurses, orderlies, uh, others within the medical industry environment you know, they have to move patients around, patients that can't move themselves, patients that can be very heavy, patients that can, can, can fight <laughs> the, the workers. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a real challenge to move patients. There are devices, there are lifting devices that can be used, there are different types of tables and, and gurneys that can be used to make it easier, but there's still a lot of manual lifting and moving of patients involved in the medical industry. There is an entire, uh, I don't remember if it's NIOSH or CDC, uh, it's one of those two organizations has a uh, has a, an ergonomics guide just for the medical industry and um, if you would like to have that guide let me know I'd be more than happy to share with share it with you. I did not include that guide on Blackboard. I, I've, I've given you so much so many resources on this subject I didn't want to overwhelm you too much but if you would like to see the uh, guide for preventing ergonomics related injuries in the medical industry more than happy to share that with you. It's, uh, it's a government publication so I can freely distribute it. Um, without violating any copyright issues. But again, let's, let's turn our attention back specifically to preventing uh, ergonomics-related injuries, uh, work-related musculoskeletal disorders. I think a first step, and I mentioned this early on, uh, companies need to have an ergonomics program. And an ergonomics program would be written policies intended to reduce exposure to primary ergonomic risk factors. After your ergonomics assessment, you identify ergonomic risk factors in the workplace. Your ergonomics program should, uh, should provide a strategy for preventing or mitigating exposure to these risk factors. I did provide this document to you on Blackboard from NIOSH and the CDC elements of an ergonomics program or elements of ergonomics programs. Um, if you end up going to work for a company and you feel there needs to be an ergonomics program implemented, maybe there isn't one or maybe it isn't very good, uh, this could be a resource that could help guide you through that process. Again, this is optional reading. Uh, it, it probably one of those documents that you'd want to download 
for later use in your career. Yeah, we could spend an entire unit just going through uh, an ergonomics program, the different elements of those programs. But this is one preventative measure that companies should implement. And I've mentioned this before, I've mentioned it in other classes. This is not an OSHA requirement, uh, but I think it is a best practice for companies control, that are interested in controlling injuries and controlling losses. Uh, fitness for duty, physical examinations. Uh, it's, it's a physical exam, it's a pre-work physical exam that will tell us if our new workers are capable of doing the job without injury. It will test their strength, their flexibility, which goes along with range of motion. Uh, many uh, uh, physical examinations like this, they will have different exercises or tasks that will be completed by the, the new worker and there will be a physician or other medical professional uh, evaluating their ability to perform those tasks. A lot of the fitness for duty exams will require um, new workers to pick up a weight and move a weight. It will assess their ability to handle uh, certain weights, do they have the flexibility to do the job and so on. The fitness for duty physical exam will also hopefully identify pre-existing injuries that could be aggravated with by certain jobs. Um, an example, another example more specifically of what might be identified uh, during these exams would be the, the worker's hip ankle flexibility. You got to have good hip ankle flexibility, knee flexibility for squatting. You need to be able to squat to some degree to lift properly. If they don't have that flexibility, if they don't have that good range of motion in their knees, they, they probably should not be doing any heavy lifting. Um, yeah. Once we discover this from their physical examination, then we might reassign them. One thing we got to be real careful with when it comes to fitness for duty physical examinations is that we could run into a problem with anti-discrimination laws. We want to be sensitive to that. We want to make sure that our, that our uh, hiring practices are in accordance with with all of the, the legal requirements to make sure that we are not violating any laws in our hiring practices. We should have attorneys review and approve our fitness for duty programs. Uh, we should have attorneys review all of our hiring practices to make sure that we're not, we're not discriminating against anyone unfairly. Um, a lot of times what occurs when companies have these, uh, uh, when, when companies use these exams, they will have already offered the position to the worker. So the worker has a job with the company. After uh, the job has been offered, the worker accepts the position, they'll then send the new employee into the clinic for the physical exam. That physical exam, uh, the physical exam uh, results uh, cannot be used to fire that new worker. That the physical exam re results though can be used to reassign the worker. Maybe you hire someone as a, as a warehouse technician, meaning they're moving boxes. Warehouse technician is a fancy label for someone that lifts boxes, moves boxes, as material handling. Uh, maybe you hire them for that position, but based upon the physical examination results, they are not really capable of doing that job uh, because of maybe it's a pre-existing injury. Maybe they don't have the flexibility uh, for whatever reason that they're not able to do that job. Well, the company can't terminate them on those grounds. Uh, the, term, the company can reassign them, should reassign them, to a position that doesn't require the same physical demands as the warehouse technician position. Uh, and a lot of times when that happens, when employees are reassigned, they end up being assigned to a job that they, they didn't apply for. A lot of times they will, they will leave on their own. 
well, this, this isn't what I applied for, so I'm going to go uh, find me another job elsewhere. So, But again, be careful with, with uh, any of your hiring practices because it can turn into problems for uh, the company. Work hardening is uh, another process that can help prevent musculoskeletal disorders. Work hardening refers to preparing the worker for hard manual labor. You slowly introduce hard physical exertion, giving the worker a chance to strengthen their muscular system and improve their capability. Uh, I think a good practice is to assume that all workers are out of shape when they come to your company. If it's a physically demanding job that they're going to be performing, assume that they're out of shape and give them a chance to acclimate to the workload. Give them, you know, put them through a two, three week work hardening uh, uh, process so that they will be more productive employees and more importantly, they won't be injured in the first week or two. Some companies go as far as having wellness programs at, which include physical exercise programs. More and more companies are adopting wellness programs uh, with personal trainers, nutritionists, uh, exercise programs designed for the workers. Uh, this can be a part of the work hardening process also. Uh, work hardening also, you'll, as you'll see probably in your career, is sometimes a part of injury recovery. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about it here as a way to prevent injury, but if a worker is injured, maybe they have, they, they develop a, a medial epicondylitis. Uh, they develop that disorder, they've been medically treated. Uh, part of that medical treatment is a gradual easing into work, uh, gradually easing them back to the point where they can perform like they were performing before the injury. And that's a work hardening process to help with their recovery. Uh, some companies, and this goes back to the wellness idea, the wellness companies with wellness programs, they're actually paying workers to exercise. And a lot of old school managers out there, I'm not gonna pay my guy to lift weights or to do laps around the track. I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. But companies that do pay workers to exercise, and there's quite a bit of research out there that's, that's being developed on this practice. Companies that do this, it, it, they get a good return on their investment. It lowers their workers' comp costs, lowers absenteeism, it improves worker morale. And all of this adds up to more productivity. More productivity, more money for the company. More output from the workers. So it, it I, the research indicates it is a win-win for the companies that do actually pay workers to exercise. You know, some companies have very elaborate on-site fitness centers, along with the personal trainers that I mentioned before and the nutritionists. And uh, these companies have, uh, they value the importance of their workers. They understand the importance of healthy, fit workers for their company. They're willing to invest in those workers and their fitness. And those companies reap rewards from that investment. So uh, if you end up working at a company, a company could have a program like this, a, a wellness program. Uh, if you go to a company that doesn't have something like this, then uh, that might be something down the road that could be recommended. Um, and it could be as simple. A, a wellness program could be very simple. It doesn't have to have an on-site gym. Uh, the first company I worked for um, after I, the first company I worked for in the private sector, uh, they didn't have an on-site gym, but they paid for the gym membership. For anyone that wanted a gym membership, it was paid for. Cost was covered. And we didn't have personal trainers, we didn't have nutritionists, but the gym membership was paid for. And there were a few employees that took advantage of it. It wasn't required. Um, and some companies are, you know, you, 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 you gotta stop just short of requiring exercise, but you really wanna encourage your workers to exercise and stay in shape. It's gonna be better for them too. Better for the company, better for them. Yeah, just a quick review here because I kind of got off away from work hardening. Work hardening is a process 
an acclimation process that prepares the worker for hard manual labor. A lot of injuries uh, affect or, or involve new workers that are out of shape. You know, they're thrown right into the right into the fire without any chance to get acclimated, and that's when when injuries are, are very likely to occur, especially if it's a physically demanding type of work. Uh, a big one, uh, this has to do with lifting, pushing, pulling related exercises. A big concern, and it should be a concern for every company, preventing force or overexertion injury. Uh, there are a variety of ways that we can accomplish this in different companies. Use lifting machines, forklifts, pallet jacks, lift tables, exoskeletons, and we'll look more closely at uh, different types of lifting machines as we move along. Set lifting limits. OSHA doesn't have a lifting limit, but what a lot of companies adopt as their lifting limits, companies, again, that have a good safety culture, understand the importance of, of, their, their, of workplace safety, they'll set that limit at 50 pounds for men, 35 pounds for women. There are also some different tools that can be used. Uh, you can use the NIOSH equation to determine what is a safe limit or a safe uh, amount of weight for different tasks. There is an optional video on using the NIOSH equation that I've, I've provided a link in Blackboard. You can also refer to these snook tables from Liberty Mutual Insurance. Again, Liberty Mutual's done years and years and years of research, very high quality research, and they've developed a, I think there are uh, 18 different tables, and each table goes with a different type of, of work activity. And these tables have lifting limits for those different work activities. You could use something like that. But most companies that I'm, I'm familiar with, they just keep it simple. They go 50 pounds for men, 35 pounds for women, as far as lifting limits. Uh, team lifting. Teach your workers if the work is, or if the weight is heavier than than what they can safely handle by themselves, have them get some help. Teach them good lifting technique, which we'll talk more about. And we'll also talk about some of the research when it comes to good lifting technique. Stretch and flex, warm up is a, is a, a practice for presenting uh, overexertion injuries. Uh, discourage manual material handling by what I call heavy packaging. Within your operation, every, everything that a worker might be tempted to lift and, and pick up manually or move manually is packaged so that it's impossible for the worker uh, to lift by themselves. That's what we mean by heavy packaging. In a warehouse, maybe every, every uh, unit that a worker might need to handle is 300 pounds. Now, if you break that down, it could be broken down into 25-pound units, but you put all these 25-pound units in a 300-pound package, uh, that discourages uh, manual material handling. You need a forklift. You need other tools uh, to assist with that, uh, with that type of load. And that's kind of counterintuitive, perhaps. You, you think, well, well, let's make everything light so that workers can handle it safely. That, that's good too. Make everything light, keep all the materials, all the loads light so uh, we don't have as many overexertion injuries. But the flip side of that, the other extreme of that, make everything heavy so that it's impossible for workers. You know, workers won't even think about trying to manually lift it because they can see it's impossibly heavy. So they use the forklift or lift tables or other devices that are provided for them. Um, what we see here in these pictures are a couple of devices. This is a device that you might see in a tire shop or a maintenance shop. You know, tires, wheels can be very heavy and injuries can occur when workers try to manually lift the tire and place it up on the hub. Lift the tire and wheel and place it up on the hub. This is a lift device that assists with that. And it's a good investment. If, if it's a tire shop that does a lot of this kind of work, excellent investment and this is a I would say this is a small tire 
tires and wheels can be much larger than this. Now this is going to weigh over 100 pounds, uh, but they can be much larger. Tractor tires, equipment tires can weigh hundreds of pounds, several hundred pounds. Um, so you definitely need um, equipment to handle those types of loads. What we have here is kind of a new thing on the scene. It's an exoskeleton. And we'll take a closer look at exoskeletons uh, in a subsequent slide. But this is a, a device worn by the worker that, in essence, makes them stronger. But more on that uh, coming up right here, in fact. And here are some different exoskeleton devices. Again, it's devices worn by workers that makes them stronger, uh, supports their, their musculoskeletal structure, and prevents injuries. And we don't see widespread usage of these yet, but I think into the future uh, we're going to see uh, greater usage. Now, I'm not going to show you this video because of time constraints. If you would like to, to watch a video or several videos about exoskeletons in the workplace, just go to YouTube, type in exoskeleton for lifting or something along those lines. And there will be a, a whole list of videos that come up. These are a variety of different uh, uh, lifting tools that are available. And notice, none of these tools have an engine. Uh, they, are, they are lower tech lifting tools. We have roller tables that can help move materials more easily with, with uh, minimal exertion. We have a lift here that's designed to lift uh, 55 gallon drums or 35 gallon drums, whatever size of drum is used in your facility. Uh, we have here what we call a manual pallet jack. It's a forklift that can be manually operated by an individual and it just requires minimal force. These are really cool. I'd like to have one at home. I have some roller tables for my woodworking activities, but this is a combination of a lift table and a roller table. You lower this table all the way down to its lower position. Uh, you place whatever material it is that you want to move. You place that onto the table. Then you push it to where you push it to the destination, jack it up. There's a foot pedal uh, that you use to jack it up to lift up the scissor mechanism. Then once you get it to where you want it, you turn the roller and then you just slide it off onto the, whatever surface it is. Again, really useful. And there are hundreds of tools like this available. And most companies that do a lot of material handling, they're going to have a lot of these tools already. But you might find some companies that don't. Uh, don't know who you're going to end up working for. You could end up working for a, a smaller manufacturing company that, that uh, could use some improvements in this area. And these are some different uh, types of devices that you might recommend. And here are more. <laughs> uh, here are more. And many of these devices are relatively inexpensive devices. The wagons that you might use, the lift tables. Uh, you, now this, is, this device up here in the corner, that's going to be a little more expensive. Uh, but most of these devices over here the two wheelers, the lift tables, the wagons, you know, probably less than 500 bucks for those devices. Maybe a little more for the lift table, but devices like this, minor investment, big return on that investment as far as preventing injuries. It goes back to our assessments, recognizing the need, doing our research, and then uh, purchasing and making available. One thing I try to talk about in some of my classes uh, that I don't think we cover enough in our program is our purchasing responsibilities as safety managers. We're going to be involved in a lot of purchasing, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, equipment, material acquisitions, and we might even be in charge of a budget uh, as a safety manager. Probably not your first job at the entry level, but eventually most of you are going to be involved with budgeting and the financial side of safety management. Uh, one of my favorite prevention methods for preventing work-related musculoskeletal disorders is uh, 
a warm up and stretching uh, program that's commonly called stretch and flex. What we see here on the slide is a stretch and flex poster that you're going to see on just about every Kiwit job and in a lot of companies. This poster identifies all of the different stretching exercises workers should perform at the start of their workday, also just before any strenuous activity. These exercises will warm up muscles, improve flexibilities, which will prevent pull and strain muscles. Also, another thing I like about the uh, about stretch and flex programs and companies that start each day with a, a warm up with a stretching period. It's a mental wake up for the workers. Yeah, you know, we'll wake up at five o'clock in the morning. We got We start work at seven. Uh, we may not be fully awake. We may not really be fully awake, awake until we're moving around. And this helps wake us up, helps get us ready mentally, not just physically, but mentally for the work that we're about to do. Um, uh, and, you know, think about this from a more common sense standpoint. When, and again, back to the, the, to the morning scenario, when you wake up in the morning, especially if you're older like me, Man, you are stiff and tight. You know, your joints are creaking, and and you're not ready to, to do any physical, uh, per perform any kind of physically demanding labor when you first wake up. But after you've had a chance to move around a little bit, get the blood pumping, get some coffee in your system. That's always good. Then you're you're going to be more prepared for that work day. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of what we're talking about with stretch and flex. Uh, more and more companies do do this, but there are still a lot of companies out there. It is a, it is a, it is difficult to persuade some companies to adopt the policy that everybody warms up before they start work, that everybody does uh, some basic, simple stretching exercises and warm-up exercises before they start work. But the companies that do this, there's some, quite a bit of good research out there. Companies that implement stretch and flex programs, they have significantly fewer soft tissue injuries. Uh, one of the first studies um, that, that tested the effectiveness of warm-up programs, uh, it was conducted in the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, Washington. Now, it uh, the subjects were not soldiers. The subjects were, were uh, individuals that worked for the Navy, civilian employees of the Navy. And that research was really eye-opening. This was in the late 70s, and that re research really opened the eyes of safety professionals uh, as, as far as the importance of warming up before work. And another thing, I just find it so uh, amusing, if you will, that companies have a hard time with this, uh, adopting this. And again, you will. It's going to be hard to convince some managers it's necessary. And uh, what I'm about to say is what I would use when, when training workers on the importance of this. Um, workers are athletes. You know, some workers are performing very athletic movements, lifting and moving and carrying. They may not be running or sprinting or jumping, but a lot of work is an athletic, uh, physically demanding activity. What do athletes do before they practice? What do athletes do before a game? Again, we're talking about again uh, football players, basketball players, baseball players, what do those athletes do before they practice or play? They warm up. They stretch. So if workers are performing athletic movements, they should also be warming up and stretching before those athletic movements. Again, to me, it's a no-brainer, and the research is pretty clear on it. Uh, workers should be doing some type of warm-up activity before starting work. Um, now, Companies that do have stretch and flex, they might not include this component. And this is this is a real hard sell. 
I tried pitching this at Keywit and I got a lot of resistance. Now Keywit's been using stretch and flex for years, but I've always thought you know, we need to, to get the heart rate up and the blood pumping before stretching. I recommended you know, uh, 30 seconds of running in place to get the heart rate up. You know, running in place is not on the uh, is not on the poster here. These are all stretching activities. Stretching a cold muscle is is and that could cause injury itself. So I, I've proposed everywhere I've been and I've had no success with it. But I proposed in 30 seconds of running in place, 30 seconds of jumping jacks. If you remember what a jumping jack is from from uh, your PE classes, you know something to get the the blood pumping uh, through the muscles, which is going to warm up the muscles, and then prepare those muscles for stretching. I think it's going to that would be more effective. And I wish I had the laboratory resources to test um, to test uh, that contention in some way. Uh, we we just don't have those resources here at NSU, at least in the College of Business. But again. If you're a new safety manager, you go to a company that's not doing this, uh, might be a recommendation you would make. And when it comes to recommendations like this, when you're the new guy or the new lady, the new young woman, uh, be very careful how you make the recommendation. Don't come in guns a-blazing, uh, roaring with enthusiasm. You know, you know, run it by your, your direct supervisor. Um, you know, ask them if they thought about it. Ask them if, if, if uh, ask him if it's something that the company might consider. Then you share with him some of the research. Uh, share with him some of the some of the information that I'm providing here. A lot of it is pretty commonsensical. Again, relate it to the world of athletics and competitive sports because the two go together. Um, yeah, you know what I'm really getting at here. If you're the new person making this proposal go slow be patient be persistent you're probably not going to get a company to to overnight adopt stretch and flex if it's not something they they've ever thought about before it's going to take some time to persuade them another thing you might do to help persuade them would be look at those injury records for the company look at the injury data look at the types of injuries the company's been having have they been having a lot of soft tissue uh, issues that you might use that information in your pitch to your supervisors that maybe we should consider stretch and flex all right let's go ahead and move on uh, team lifting i've mentioned loads greater than 50 pounds again this is an osha this is oftentimes a company you'll see this commonly as a company standard any loads greater than 50 pounds you need to get some help if it's a bulky load that's, that, uh, that uh, is difficult for one person to handle, team lifting also. An example would be a sheet of plywood. Sheet of plywood, four feet by eight feet. Uh, three quarter inch plywood can weigh in the neighborhood of 60 or 70 pounds, which that's over the 50 pound limit. Uh, but it, let's say it's half inch plywood and it's 45 pounds. It's less than the 50 pound limit, but it's very difficult to, to, to handle that four by eight sheet, especially if it's outdoors and it's windy and maybe you're walking on rough terrain, get some help with these kind of bulky loads. Uh, be careful with a load that you can't get a good grip on. You might want to get some help if it's a type of load that you can't get a good grip on. You have a poor handhold, poor grip quality. Uh, plywood would also be an example of that. It's very awkward lifting plywood. And a couple of workers in my career have developed uh, uh, work-related musculoskeletal disorders, and not from any one instance. It wasn't a catastrophic chronic uh, or acute uh, exposure that caused their, their problems, but it was long-term wear and tear from lifting plywood and carrying plywood. Uh, a couple of workers had to have shoulder surgeries from that long-term wear and tear. Uh, remind your workers, and depending on the, the workplace culture that we're talking about, this can be difficult. Remind your workers that the workplace is not a powerlifting competition. 
build a culture where it is okay for workers to ask for help. Uh, some workplaces, you're going to have to defeat this these mentalities here. The macho male, the show-off, uh, the, the thoughts about, you know, I'm bulletproof, I can do anything. you got to reprogram workers uh, away from these mindsets. You see this a lot in construction. Uh, guys are competitive. Uh, even the women are competitive in the construction. And there's this macho, tough guy, tough person uh, culture that can contribute to workers trying to lift more than they can safely handle. So you got to work on that also as a safety professional. Now, where you're most likely to see the, the bulletproof mentality, the macho mentality become a problem, or even in the competition, it's usually going to be the young, the younger, the inexperienced, the greener workers. Yeah, they're just, they just haven't matured. Uh, they, they need supervision. Uh, it may not be directly from you, but the, the, the foreman, the superintendents that, that are their direct supervisors need to keep an eye on these young guys. A lot of times young people get into trouble because they have this I'm bulletproof mentality. You'll have a lot of young workers uh, on a, in, in the workplace. They've never felt pain. They've never been injured. They don't know what it is, so they're, they can be careless. Uh, so, so they need supervision. They need someone, hey, you know, you need to get some help. That, that weighs 90 pounds. You need to get, some, you know, call, call a buddy over to help you lift that. They need that kind of supervision. Here are some uh, photos showing good lifting technique using the legs, uh, poor lifting technique, you know, bending at the waist and just using the back, back not taking full advantage of the strongest muscles in their body. Strongest muscles in, their, in a person's body are there and there. And when you're uh, lifting like this, you're not using those strongest muscles. Now here, uh, you are in a good lifting position, keeping the load close to the body, lifting with the legs, and you're also, it's a team lift. You got two people working together to make the lift. Uh, uh, lifting technique has received a lot of attention over the years. There's a certain uh, do's and don'ts that are recommended that you will hear commonly over and over again. Uh, the research, though, as far as the effectiveness of training lifting technique is, is really mixed. A lot of that, a lot of the research findings suggest that just training workers to lift properly doesn't have a real effect on the uh, occurrence of injuries in the workplace. It needs to be more than that. And I would argue it's more than lifting technique, it's load limiting. Limit the loads. Uh, teach team lifting. You know, limit the amount of weight on the, on the worker. That's more important than lifting technique. But you now lifting technique is still important. We still need to pay attention to it. The first step in proper lifting technique is for the workers to know the weight of whatever it is they're trying to lift. If they don't know the weight exactly, they need to you know, test the weight. You know, they go ahead and squat down to it and try to lift it. If they have to grunt, groan, or strain too much to start that lift to get that load uh, moving, it's too heavy. They need to get some help. They need to go get a machine. Uh, no twisting at the waist. Keep the weight in front of your body and also close to your body, close to your center of gravity. The greater distance between our, our center of gravity and the load, the greater the force on the worker. Uh, and you know, just in class, I do a simple little demonstration. I'll bring in a 10-pound dumbbell, and I'll have a, I'll you know, get one of the football players or somebody here. Just you know, hold that 10-pound dumbbell close to your body. You know, in, in this position here. And uh, and I'll ask them, well, how long can you can you hold that 10 pound dumbbell in that position? I'm like all day, I can do this forever. Now I have them extend their arm out in front of them. That's a different story. Here it's close to the center of gravity. 
to their center of gravity. Out here, it's further from their center of gravity, which increases the force, the loading on the body. And I'll have them stand there as long as they can until they can't. And within 30, 45 seconds, most people are going to have to lower that. That's about all they can do, even with only 10 pounds. So keep the weight close to the center of gravity. Make sure workers understand this. Use the leg and gluteal muscles as much as possible because they are your stronger muscles. Don't bend at the waist. Squat down to the load. Good grip is important. Make sure you have a good grip. And there are grip assist devices that can be provided to workers to help them maintain a good grip. Uh, don't reach with the load. If you're, if you're carrying an object to sit on a table, always keep that object as close to your body as possible. Don't reach out to set it on the table. Move your feet. To move the load from point A to point B, use your feet, not your reach. Because if you, if you reach out with the load, then we're going back to increased force because of that distance. Because what, what we're talking about here is increased load moment, to use a, a physics term. Uh, load moment, moment is equal to the weight times the distance. Or sometimes you'll see it force times distance. But moment increases as uh, either of these variables increase. And you want to keep that load moment as low as possible. Also, this is a big deal in the crane world. Uh, you know, as you probably know, cranes is one of my specialties. And uh, load moment is, is, is something that we have to pay attention to to prevent tipping or structural failure of, of, of cranes. If you think about it, human body is kind of like a crane. You know, cranes used to lift and move heavy materials. We do the same thing with the human body. Uh, if we follow these simple uh, guidelines, we are much less likely to have any lifting-related uh, disorders. If our workers follow these guidelines, we're much less likely to have any problems. It still could happen. Uh, I, I think limit the weight is the most important. Limit weight. And if they have to grunt, groan, strain to get that thing moving, it's, it's too much. They need help. We also have to watch workers with poor flexibility as well. Uh, oh, and here's the reference I made uh, earlier. And there is discussion in chapter 13 of your text that goes along with this. Uh, numerous studies indicate that lifting technique has little to do with back injury prevention. Uh, again, more details concerning that point in, in your textbook. So again, lifting technique is important, but limiting the weight is more important. Limiting the forces imposed on the worker is most important. These are some devices that can be used to help workers with their grip. Uh, Anything that, that is in the form of a plate is difficult to handle, like a sheet of plywood. Or here we got oriented strand board to be more precise. This is a device here that is designed to help workers carry plywood. That is, it, I, injuries could still occur with this device. I like this device a lot better. The way the shoulder is torqued I don't really like that. Uh, a worker doing that all day in that position is going to have some pain. Over months or years of doing this, they may end up needing uh, shoulder surgery. This is much more of a neutral position for the shoulder. Uh, and this type of, of lifting device for plywood uh, is what I would recommend to workers. Uh, then we have different devices for lifting plates of glass, uh, steel plate. This is a magnetic device that makes it easier to grip steel plate. Uh, this device here uh, that we've already talked about, could, anything 
that's in sheet form could be handled uh, more safely with this device. Uh, plywood, steel, uh, sheetrock material uh, can could be uh, moved more easily with these devices. Uh, another, we're kind of shifting gears here from overexertion to posture. Improving work posture is important for uh, mitigating or lowering the probability that work-related musculoskeletal disorders will occur. Seated employees especially, as I've mentioned before, are highly prone to develop to developing MSDs. And it's a lot most of the time related to poor posture along with static posture. Workers need to be aware of this. One of the things we can do to improve work posture is make workers aware of good posture. And here I'm stretching to maintain my posture uh, as I'm speaking. But making workers aware of the importance of maintaining a neutral posture. Uh, conducting a work position analysis using a method called RULA or a method called REBA. Uh, these methods, uh, to learn more about these methods, uh, you could look at the video, the optional video that's available to you on, back, on Blackboard. I talk in, in greater detail about these methods. Also, take the full-blown ergonomics class and, and you're going to have a unit on a lot of different tools and how to use those different tools for ergonomic assessment. Uh, when it comes to seated employees, it might be possible to, to take those employees out of their seat, uh, build or provide standing workstations for them. One uh, tool that's available for workers who would prefer to stand is a Veridesk. This is a Veridesk right here. It is a scissor device. You can raise and lower the, the work space to different levels, whatever the worker wants. A worker could lower it all the way down and they could be seated at work. Worker needs to stand up, they need to move around, they can elevate their monitor and their keyboard or whatever, whatever else it is they may be working on. Uh, provide good seating. Ergonomically divine, uh, defined, uh, not defined, ergonomically designed seating which we'll talk more about. Uh, have a mandatory uh, stretch and flex interval built into the workday. Make it mandatory, and again, mandatory, nobody likes to hear that word. Nobody likes to feel like they're being forced to do something, but uh, it, it's for the good of the workers. Have them every 15 to 20 minutes strand, stand up, stretch and flex, move around. This can be very important for uh, preventing any problems related to static posture. Monitor and keyboard placement is also important. Make sure the monitor and the keyboard are placed properly. Monitor at the right height, keyboard the right distance from the body. You don't want the keyboard way out in front, they're reaching for it. It needs to be in a comfortable working position. Monitor, as we'll see, should be just at eye level or maybe a little below eye level. And, and some workers are going to require some accommodation. Some, there's going to be some variation also. Um, yeah, avoid reaching and forward bending and looking down during the workday. And monitor and keyboard placement can help us avoid these, these, these habits or these practices. This is another commonly available uh, device that could help with work posture. It is an adjustable height table or adjustable height workbench. Now this is a very simple one here. There are some that are very elaborate that have uh, uh, that are electric powered, hydraulics, a whole nine yards. You just push a button, it'll raise up. Push another button, it'll lower down. This is a manual. Uh, adjustable height work table. But the concept of adjustable height work table is one for us to remember. It might be something that we can implement in our in our different operations that we're managing. Okay, one more slide and then I'm going to 
go ahead and end this video here. We're going to have a two-parter for prevention. Uh, the second part may not be that long. But here are some uh, different seating devices that can be utilized to improve work posture for the seated worker, for the office workers. And just as a reminder, it's estimated that up to 80% of desk workers will suffer from extended periods of back pain. We made a similar point earlier on in this unit. It's not just the guys in the warehouse that have bad backs, it's the office workers, it's the men and women in accounting, it's the men and women uh, in data entry also. Uh, and some, of these, uh, some of these ergonomic seating systems that have been developed, I kinda, I'm skeptical about. What I recommend is uh, having workers involved and picking out the right chair for them and use a good office supply store that allows a, a period, a trial period, a try before you buy for chairs. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of good office supply stores will give, give companies a, a one month trial period to try out the chairs. Uh, if a you know, worker can use it for two or three weeks, ah, this really isn't working, I've got lower back pain, I've got op upper back pain, my shoulder's bothering me, whatever. Well, they can, they can send it back to the office supply store. The office supply store will send them out something else to try. Because it is very important to get that right chair for the worker. For the workers who sit eight, 10 hours a day, right chair is absolutely essential. Yep. Well, let's, let's go ahead and finish this since we're on the subject of chairs. Uh, what to look for in an office chair. Good adjustability. The height of the seat, the seat pan height. Armrest position. All of these things should be adjustable. Height, armrest position, angle of the chair back should be adjustable. Uh, does it have lumbar support? Something else to look at. Head and neck support. Here's a good example of head and neck support. This is, a, this is probably a $1,500, $2,000 chair right here. Very adjustable. It has a built-in rest uh, or, or work, work rest for a lap, laptop notebook computer. Um, has, a, has a foot rest also built into it. Uh, this one over here is kind of unique because it has, uh, it has a split back design. You can adjust uh, the back more, you have more flexibility in adjusting the chair back with this split design. Uh, feet on the floor or other support. If a worker's feet are dangling from a chair, that can result in musculoskeletal disorders. It, it's, a, it's a compression contra, a contact stress issue that can affect circulation, musculoskeletal uh, structure, and so on. Uh, one thing about notebook and laptop computers in general, they are not conducive to good work posture. The way they're designed, the way they're commonly used. It's, if you, it's okay to have notebook and laptop computers, but it's recommended that there be a separate external full-size keyboard that's connected to the notebook, and there's also a separate monitor. You just have the, the, the notebook computer over to the side, but you have the monitor in front of you, you have the keyboard in front of you that uh, allows for uh, better adjustment. That's, that's more ergonomically friendly. But Now this works out pretty well here with this uh, young woman because she has the chair designed with the work rest for the notebook computer. But, uh, Notebooks at a normal work table or work desk are not conducive to good work posture. Uh, what I've already described in essence with a separate keyboard and a monitor is a, is a docking station that has that separate monitor keyboard and mouse is also recommended a separate mouse. Even something as simple as your mouse and I'm moving, I'm using my rollerball mouse right now to move that around can have uh, ergonomic benefits. 
Uh, a rollerball mouse does not require you to move your arm. Again, a conventional mouse, you've got, I'm exaggerating here, but you've got to move your arm around to get that uh, cursor to move or to get any objects that you're working with to move on your screen. Rollerball, you don't move your arm. And here I am right here, rollerball, I'm not moving my arm, I'm just moving my thumb. And I can, I can highlight, click on, and, and move anything around I want without the movement of my arm like this. It's a little thing, but little things can make a big difference for uh, when it comes to, to improving the ergonomics in the workplace. All right, and I am going to stop there. Um, this will be the end of our first prevention video. I'll come back and we'll do a second prevention video.